Amplify. Inspire. Act. This is Detroit 2020. And tonight here on Detroit 2020, we're talking about the Woodward Avenue light rail project. Planning for that project started way back in 2006, but now they're getting ready to break ground, maybe within the next year, on a rail line that will extend down Woodward from Detroit to 8 Mile with 19 stops in between. We're joined right now by Matt Cullen. He is the project CEO of the M1 Rail Project. We're also joined by Heather Carmona, the executive director of the Woodward Avenue Action Association. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Absolutely. All right, Matt, we're going to start with you. How important is this to the city of Detroit? to get that lifeline, as we showed in my piece, that people getting around Detroit have trouble, getting out of Detroit having trouble, people getting into Detroit have trouble. I, I think it's critically important. I mean, it, it, it really is two things. It's transit for sure and it's connection, and people need to be able to move around within the city and then ultimately uh, throughout the district. And, and importantly, it's about economic development. If you look around the country and you see where these systems are put in place, they have a tendency to attract six to eight times the investment in transit in economic development. And so it, it's very much... Uh, a joint outcome that's really important, I think, to the city and the region. Heather, let's bring you in because you represent a group that has the interest of what? Five political leaders in our community. You told me the five communities Ferndale, Royal Oak, Birmingham, Huntingwood, Huntington Woods, and Berkeley. And they want this rail line to be extended, right? To right, southern right. Oakland County? Right. Actually, our association is all of the communities along Woodward Avenue in Detroit. But the effort as it relates to transit has really been championed by the South Oakland communities who, who are looking to take the light rail project and say, we want to continue this north. And there's really never been consensus among all those communities as to what that means. So they've been convening to, to, to build that vision and that consensus to take it further. Yeah, Heather, we talked about the elephant in the room and the discussion right. has always been the fact that the suburbs are just afraid of letting the city into the suburbs. And in some cases, the city are afraid to let the suburbs into the city. Yeah, have I we gone past that? Well, I those fears died, yeah. I, I don't know necessarily if that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think there's just maybe not enough communication, lack of knowledge. And, you know, in talking to folks in the city, they'd love to see the regional. Mm -hmm. They want to see it go north. They're just in the confines of the city. They, you know, they're, they're, their role is not to further something further north. They're supportive of the regional transit plan, but they're going to work within the city. As equally, in Ferndale, as an elected official, she's concerned about what's happening in Ferndale. It doesn't mean that she can't pay attention to what's happening um, to her, her neighboring community. So I think it's communication, and that's where um, this group is coming together and really making sure that there's no assumptions that are unfair assumptions made. And Matt, mm. talk a little bit about the benefits. I mean, a lot of job growth, just like with the riverfront. It's a public-private uh, funding of this, of this project, but also the jobs and then businesses that will come, right? For sure. Well, it is a very unique model. I mean, very similar to the, to the riverfront, and that is public-private. I think what's really exciting about this is that the private philanthropy of groups like the Kresge organizations, a lot of corporations that have put in significant money has allowed the federal government to take a look at this and say, look, this is different than anything we've ever seen across the country. So we're going we're gonna to have a particular focus to this. We're going to move Detroit and this project up to the front of the queue and provide very significant financial resources from a federal standpoint in order to get this $500 million project done as one project under the leadership of Mayor Bing, which is terrific. So to your point then, that, that drives economic development. If you look at a $500 million investment and you take the typical ratio of six to eight times, it's, it's three, four billion dollars worth of development is the proven track record if you benchmark around the country. So it's transit, it's really important to move people around, it's a big economic development driver in that way, but it, it ends up in jobs, it ends up in people living along the line, it ends up in people having the opportunity to live, work, and play in the community. And that's what the young folks getting out of school want to do, too. They don't want to take their car everywhere and go everything else. They want to be able to live downtown in Midtown, take the train to the ball games, go back out in, in, into the grocery store and do a lot of that kind of thing. And, and so it, it, it is a lot more than just a transit system. Now, we know this, uh, Heather, we know this This program is already on the, uh, on the move in Detroit. So what are we going to do now to get that thing from 8 Mile and beyond? Is there Are there plans, concrete plans in place to get the right-of-ways and all that kind of thing? Not yet. This group isn't that far along. And as Matt knows, it takes years in the making. And, and it really needs to develop that vision and that consensus as to what these communities want to see. And I was sharing with Carolyn that this is the first time many of these communities have even talked about this. Mm -hmm. And there's an assumption, again, that there's dialogue among communities about what what their, their desires are. And one community may want right-of-way, the line on the right-of-way. The other may want it in the median. So those are things that I think they, they're all beginning to discuss right now. What, what, is, what is important is that they're, they're talking and that there's consensus that they want to see some, some continuation of, of what's happening in Detroit. Matt, one last question for you. How soon will we really see this, a finished product? 
We are going to see uh, at least a ceremonial groundbreaking this year. We're going to see significant construction take place next year. We would expect to be done with the first phase, 3.4 miles from Jefferson uh, uh, all the way up to the boulevard. Uh, by the end of 2013, second phase would take up right from there and be done by the t end of 2015. So, And we feel good about it. I mean, we're not done with the EIS process. Right. There's a hearing uh, this Friday, uh, public hearing. We, we're looking for public feedback. But if we get the kind of support we expect and the federal government comes in as we expect, uh, that would be the outcome. All right. No kidding. It's really going to happen. Oh, it's really going to happen. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got again with us uh, uh, Matt Cullen and Heather Carmona. Thank you very much for both being here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, if you'd like to get involved with the Woodward Light Rail Project, there are two public hearings scheduled for Saturday. The first will be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the second uh, meeting will start at 4 p.m. and that one runs through 6 p.m. That is the main Detroit Public Library right there on Woodward. It'll be right in front of where the train tracks are going to go by. Both hearings are going to be on the lower level auditorium. If you'd like more information, all you do is uh, head to our website at uh, Detroit 2020.com. Again, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it.